All righty. Your attention, folks. Uh, gentlemen, we've got a different microphone today. It's slightly more picking up ambient noise, so it'll pick up more conversations. So please keep them to a minimum during the demonstration part. If you have questions, it's actually a great microphone for that because it'll actually pick up the question for the audience, such as your peers who aren't here. Okay, so this video is mostly for them and for you if you want to go back and revise this and you forgot what we talked about. Uh, but just keep that in mind that it's recording. Uh, so, vectors as a function of time, there is one syllabus descriptor that we're hitting today. The descriptor reads, examine the position of two particles, each described as a vector function of time, and determine if their paths cross or if the particles meet or collide. Right, so hopefully if you're interested in space, this one will be interesting to you because we can actually model, or scientists have modeled, the planets, satellites, our rockets, etc., uh, as functions of time. Right, they orbit the sun on particular like orbits and we can predict where the uh, planets and our particles that we send into space, like rockets and stuff, we can predict where they're going to be and when. So. Obviously not to the level that I'm going to teach you today, very basic level today, because we don't factor in gravity and all those other things, but the concept is the same. If we're going to land a rocket on Mars, we need to know that the rocket and Mars are going to be in the same space at the same time in the future. So if we can model both paths of the two particles, particles being Mars and the rocket, then we can land a rocket on the moon, uh, on the Mars, which is pretty cool. Um, we're just going to be doing basic stuff today, obviously, but this is the base level if you're going to be taking a path in that field, which would be pretty cool if you did. Um, so we're just going to jump through this example, if you're following along in the OneNote, is basically what we did last lesson, turning a vector, vector function of time into a Cartesian equation. Okay, I'll leave that to you if you want to go back and practice. But the new thing is something like this question here, I'm actually going to delete the old information. Okay, so we've got two particles <coughs> written as vector functions of time. So the i and the j component, so this is only a two dimensional example. Of course, we would use 3D in tougher examples, but to start, we'll go to 2D one, and both i and j components of both particles are a function of time. So if we substitute t equals 4 in to both, we could just figure out where both particles are when t equals 4. But if we want to figure out something like where do the two particles collide, we need to figure out a better system than just subbing in t values and finding out when they're the same. Because that's just like trial and error, it'll take ages. So uh, we solve simultaneously. We're going to solve for when the i components are the same, and also solve for when the j components are the same. And if they're the same at the same time, then the particles collide. Okay, so step one for this type of question, which is step one, where and when do the two particles collide? We start with when, and we'll figure out where afterwards. For example one, we have R1 of T, and I recommend that you follow along, write the two vectors down, etc. with this example, two T minus three I. two particles.
So for part A, when slash, we'll actually ask for where do they collide, but in order to figure out where, we need to figure out when. Right. So first we have to figure out when, and to do that we solve simultaneously. The i's have to be equal, and the j's have to be equal. So we should write 2t minus 3 must equal t plus 2. And we're going to solve that for t. This one's nice and easy. We're going to subtract t and add 3. So this is going to get us t equals 5. T equals 5. Now that's when the i components are equal doesn't necessarily mean the particles have collided yet, right? Because if we're just thinking in two dimensions, uh, if the I components are equal, we could have one particle here and one particle here. So to make sure they actually collide, those J components have to be equal as well. So we do the same thing over here. So we've got T squared plus 10 must also equal 7T. Quadratic, so we subtract 7T. We solve that. Hopefully we don't have to use the quadratic formula. If you do, you do, but we don't. Two things that multiply to 10 and add to negative 7. Maybe 5, negative 2. Let's go. Minus 5, minus 2. And therefore, t equals 5 and t equals 2. So because it's quadratic, there's actually two solutions. Or in other words, if this is the j components, height, there's two times when the heights are the same. But remember, we could have one particle being here and one particle being here at t equals 2. All right? t equals 2. t equals 2. I'll get rid of these two. Right? So they have the same height, but they're in different locations. Heights are the same at t equals 2, but not the widths. The only common crossover point for height and width, height and lateral movement I suppose, is t equals 5, right? So the i components are equal here and the j components are also equal here and so the particles will collide at t equals 5 because they're basically occupying the same space. But that's when. Question asked for the point at which, so where. Two, the where, sub in t equals five. You can pick either of them. I'm going to pick the second particle because it doesn't have a quadratic and it's going to be easier. So R, good board, R2 of t is equal to t plus two, which is going to be five plus two. In the I direction. Say again, yeah, five. And seven lots of five in the j direction, which is going to be seven i plus 35j. So what I've done is taken the time that they collide, t equals five, and just substituted into the second particle. Because if they're colliding, the two particles are the same space, so I don't have to do it for both, just one of them. Does does the i and j component always like equal each other? In the yes. Okay. If you want to figure out where they collide, the if you think about it, the side to side positions have to be the same. Yeah. So for me here, but so does the up and down. So the j's have to be equal. Uh, yeah. What does that look like when you graph it? Since you have t equals five, then you have seven plus five j. Right. So the question, folks, over there. Okay, the question was, uh, what does it look like when you graph it? And we would just graph it on a Cartesian plane, like this, and it would be seven across and 35 up, would be the vector point where they collide. But if you wanted to graph like each particle, you would have to convert them to a Cartesian equation, like we were doing in the last lesson, in order to graph what each path looks like, and you would find that they end up crossing. So it might actually be, that's a good question, into a segue of some practice from last lesson. For this function here, I would like you to go ahead 
and determine the Cartesian equation of this vector. So you have notes from last lesson, turning a vector function into a Cartesian equation. I'd like you to practice with the second one. You can also do it with the first one if you'd like. Take a pause and go for that. So what is the R stand for? R is just a generic letter we use for vector, like U and V. Okay, so this is a vector that's... Sorry. This is a vector, yeah. Yeah, I should have been using that. So the vectors that are represented by it, like they're affected directly by time. Yes. Time isn't an axis? No. So these are, you've got your i and your j components. So it would be unlike your normal plane. Uh, this is actually going to represent a whole series of vectors, not just one vector. So as you put in different values of t, the vectors that come out of it will be different. So you could have a series of vectors. Kind of like, if I watch on the TV, if I go to last lesson, uh, this one here, if I have this vector equation, if we substitute in different t values, we get all these different vectors that satisfy the equation, and the endpoints of those vectors form this straight line. So this straight line represents all the different possible positions of the vector given different time variables. But the time is not <laughs> X and Y or I and J. They're not based on time. The time will tell you where the vector is at that point in time. Or where the particle is. It's like a third axis. It's like, you know how we live in 3D space? But if you consider time as the fourth dimension, it's like 4D space. This is like 3D vectors, but on a 2D plane. Okay, so X and Y just take place. And when we do 3D planes, X, Y, and Z, we do the exact same thing. Um, but your fourth dimension will be done. Yeah. Because if it was moving like a circle around a like three dimensional space, yeah. that, no, no, that's not going to be directly to time on the axis. That's right. It's just, oh, yeah. just where the particle is at any point in time. Okay. Yeah. Do we get an answer yet? Yes. What do we get? Y equals 7x minus 14. Y equals 7x uh, minus 14. 14. Okay, I'm going to say 7x minus 14. What? So, let's confirm. Let, so, let x equal This is, what's this skill? I'm just going to say. Alright, guys. Converting. Oh. Vectors uh, into Cartesian. Did you get that? 7. Alright, I agree. So, reminder, this skill is start with the x component, or the i component is your x. So x equals t plus 2, rearrange for t. Okay, so now you have t in terms of x. Hence, you can substitute this in here to get the Cartesian equation with no t's at all. This is a straight line. This represents the position, every single possible position, of this vector. Now, I was just talking to Josh while you guys were working. This vector represents every possible position vector. This is not one vector because it's got a variable in it. Right? Our vectors like 7i plus 35j, that's a vector. This is I guess infinitely many vectors depending on what t is. And rather than testing out every single one as a reminder from last lesson, 
rather than testing every possible vector and trying to figure out what it looks like, those results look like, we convert it to a Cartesian equation and we could just sketch that in decimals if we wanted to. One more practice of that, can we do it for vector one here? Convert that to Cartesian form. This might be yucky, but do it anyway. And then we can plot it on Desmos and actually look and see the paths crossing at this point. Same thing here. Where is this? R2T. But you can leave it like that if you want, because we're just going to sketch in distance. Oh, here we go. So we got uh, 2t minus 3 equals x. 2t equals x plus 3. t equals x plus 3. Oh, wait. I thought it was fine. I just simplified this. Okay, gents, you're on. Are you paralyzed? Yes. Oh, that's unfortunate. Okay, y equals x plus 3 on 2 all squared. You could expand it and simplify, but for our purposes of just sketching it in Desmos, that's fine for us. But because we've got x squared involved, it's going to be some sort of quadratic function. So let's actually jump over to Desmos and we'll see what this bad boy looks like. Feel free to do it yourselves on Desmos. So No, but we will. Uh, f of x, f sub 1 of x. No, we'll just f of x and g of x, that's too fancy. Uh, right. Uh, oh, it's up. She's up there. All right. And h or g of x, seven x minus. Okay, guys. So I've sketched them both. The red function. The red function is our quadratic. The blue function is our straight line. And if we zoom out, we'll be able to see that they cross here at seven and thirty-five. So good. That's what we got. Uh, when t equals 2, it's the, what about the 5? Yeah. So that 5 just tells me where this vector is. So if we had a position vector for both of them, they would both start at 0, and our vector would just go up until 735. So these t values are just telling you where the particle is. 
So the particle is just going to go up and down this line, this blue line. And this other particle is going to go down and then up based on T. When they are at this exact same point, the particles are going to run into each other. So we could have something like this happening. They collide. And then they go off in different directions. Okay. Uh, now, folks, yes, further up, the particles actually cross again. This is presumably when t equals 2. I haven't investigated further, but presumably when t equals 2, they meet at, or well, they cross here. But these particles from our investigation don't collide here. So the paths of the particles cross, like the straight line and the parabola cross over. But at this point in time, the particles aren't both here. Right? When the blue one's here, the red one might be further up. And when the red one's here, the blue one might be further down. Because they're travelling at different speeds and on different paths. Their paths cross, but they don't necessarily collide. And that's number two in blue over on the side. We can figure out, and that's the next thing we're going to do, we can figure out when the paths cross, even though the particles aren't actually colliding at that point. Okay. So, uh, to do that, we have to do a very counterintuitive thing and use two different time variables. So, let's do it. We're going to, so first of all, again, we're going to figure out when is first. When, question mark. Uh, use two time variables. So what that looks like is we might say R1 can still be in terms of T. So we'll still say R1 of T equals that. But we're going to define R2 in terms of let's say S. You pick whatever letter you want. We're just going to use S to represent a different time variable. So we end up getting S plus 2 in the I direction and T squared plus 10, no, not T squared plus 10, 7 T. 7 S in this case, in the J direction. But the procedure is going to be the same. We're going to let the I's be equal to one another. And then whatever we get for that, S is going to be in terms of T, or T is going to be in terms of S, one or the other one. And we're going to sub it into the J components. So we'll do that together, and you guys will practice on one. Uh, these two things are going to be equal, just like before. So we're going to get S plus 2 equals 2T two minus 3. And let's solve for S. You could solve for T, but it looks like it's going to be way easier to solve for S. So subtract 2, 2t two minus 5. Now, that's a, like, that doesn't tell us anything yet, but if the paths are crossing, that means the j components will be equal to. So we're going to let these two things equal each other as well. So we get t squared plus 10. Well, let's do it for 7s first. 7s equals t squared plus 10. But s is 2t minus 5. So we're going to sub that in. And we get 7 lots of 2t minus 5 equals t squared plus 10. And you can see that it's turning into uh, a quadratic with just one variable again. So similar to this procedure here. So we'll solve that. Uh, expand out here, we get 14t minus 35 is t squared plus 10. Let's bring everything over to the t-squared side. So we'll have t-squared minus 14t. And we're adding 35 to 10 to make 45. Things that multiply to 45 and add to negative 14. Negative 9, negative 5. Negative 9, negative 5. Fantastic. So t minus 9. T minus 5. So therefore, T equals 9 and T equals 5. Now, we already established in part A 
that yes, the paths cross here. In fact, the particles collide at this point. That was part A. So we don't need to continue investigating T equals five. We already know where and we already know when. So we're going to focus mostly on T equals nine now. And we're going to do two things with that. We've got to sub T equals nine into R1 of T. And that's going to tell us, uh, wait, what's this question actually asking? Hold on. The point at which the two paths cross. At t equals 9, they will cross. So we can sub that back in here and just find out where they cross. Okay. t equals 9 is not going to be the same as s. Like s equals 9 is not going to happen because otherwise they would collide. So we can find out where, uh, sorry, when this particle gets to the position. I'll do that shortly. So I figure I'm doing too, there's too many threads at this point in time. I'm going to focus on one thread. The thread being we know the particles cross, their paths cross at t equals 9. So at t equals 9, where is this particle? Okay, that's the first thing. Um, let's do it. Two. Where at t equals 9? Question mark. Sub in. So we get R1 of 9. Uh, that was a good one. Yeah. 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 Why? Because the coordinates that we looked at on Desmos, it wasn't actually t equals 2, 1591. 1591. It was when the paths cross again. So, yes, having it on Desmos helps, and we can visualize it better. But the point of today's lesson is when we're using vectors as a function of time, we can just do the algebra and the math and not actually have to sketch them. So in a tech-free environment, you don't have to go ahead and sketch this parabola perfectly on a set of axes. You can just solve mathematically. Now, if we substitute 9 in here, we're not going to get the same point. That's because t equals 9, not s equals 9. So this is the other thread that I was talking about. The first thread, where do they cross? These are where the paths cross at 15 and 91. What we can also do is sub t equals 9 into this equation for s and find out when, not where, but when does this particle get hit. Let's do that real quick. So we're going to say uh, s equals 2 lots of 9 minus 5. s equals 18 minus 5, which is going to be uh, 13 which is telling me 13 seconds in, or whatever the time unit is. is it seconds? Doesn't tell us. Doesn't tell us, whatever the time unit is. Let's say it's seconds. At nine seconds in, particle one is here. At 13 seconds in, particle two is here. But this is where they, the paths cross, just at different times. So they both occupy the same position at different times. It's like if I was running a race against Cam, I'd get to the finish line in the same place as him, but several seconds before him. A solid four seconds over 100 metres, I would say. We will. Uh, so, I'm going to pause now. We've done two skills. Where do they collide? You let the I's and J's equal each other, and then find out where, based on this time. If, they, if you're asking where the paths cross, you need to use two different times. Because the particles are both getting the same point, but at different times. So use a different time variable and still solve. I'm going to pause for questions. It's a pretty tricky topic.
take some time to process and go back through everything we've done. Yeah, so this procedure that we did was just so we could visualize it on Desmos. Oh, yeah. You never, well, not never, but you don't have to do that. Do we ever have to find the speed of the particle using this? Uh, not based on the skills you have now, but yes. Because we're going to do, you know how you've been doing derivatives in methods? Yeah. You're going to be doing calculus in specialist, but we focus on vector calculus. So we're going to derive, so if this is position, both of these are positions, if we find the derivative, have you done kinematics yet? Yes. Yeah. yeah. If we find the derivative of position, what do we get? Velocity. Velocity. So we can derive these two and then find the velocity of the particle, which is just the magnitude of the vector. The good news is, and we don't have to do it now because we're not up to it, but it's really easy to derive vectors. You just derive the I component and then the J component and then the K component. So the derivative of this would be 2i plus 2tj. What would, for second derivatives, have you, have you found the acceleration mm -hmm. Would that be possible since the yep. time where the, the t would be removed? So it'd be constant acceleration. That is what that would mean. So that would be that would disappear. So there'd be no acceleration in the i direction, and the acceleration here would be two j. So it's accelerating up at two meters per second squared. But yeah, you you would also do that. Typically in specialists, though, we focus on projectile motion. So if I throw this, throw it back. So both times we threw it. The pen went up and then down, right? Because let's say we roughly threw it at the from the same height and Cam caught it at the same height. The particle goes up and down and projectile motion is always parabolic. It's always quadratic. It's symmetrical. The reason for that is let's assume that the only force acting on the pen once it's been released is gravity pulling it down. Right, it would... I would never throw a pen with just gravity affecting it and have it go up. Right? People do that sort of thing with frisbees and stuff, but that's because there's air resistance and it could blah, blah, blah. We don't have to model that. All we model is in a vacuum, not a vacuum because there's gravity, but if we throw a pen, it goes up and then down, and it's symmetrical. So the peak of that pen, assuming I caught it at the same height, is equidistant between us. And we can investigate that by starting with acceleration and working backwards. But we'll, that's a, a whole big unit, and we'll be starting that next year in term one. But it does exist, yeah. yeah. I'm still confused about how the derivative will get us full velocity. So we can have a different, we can have a velocity in the I direction and a velocity in the J direction. We combine them make a velocity in that direction. But to figure out that velocity, we find the magnitude of the velocity vector. Yep. And same with the acceleration vector. Yep. Any other questions, folks? Okay, let's practice one. Uh, I'll control Z now because I don't want to actually delete that. Oh, sorry, we have one more part. Gentlemen, focus up. One more part, sorry. The distance between the particles when t equals 1. Uh, essentially, this one is going to be you sub in t equals 1. Back. You sub in t equals 1. This is for part C. You sub t equals 1 into both and find the two different position vectors and then find the distance between them. Which I think that you guys can do. So... Sub t equals 1 into both and find out the positions of each and then tell me the distance between those two points. Yep. Yep. A vector between them. Find the magnitude. So there you go. Then we can practice. Right now. Yeah, right now. I'll make some space for getting rid of this. Yo. Uh, 
Question for now slash homework because you won't finish in time is <laughs> these two or two vectors in the same question. Feel free to use the example above. Geez, that's a long 